All right, so this is the evaluation and treatment of shoulder instability, and I'm Spencer Stein. I'm an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in sports medicine. Uh, I am based at Jamaica and Flushing Hospitals. My office is at Woodside uh, in Woodside, New York. We are part of Orthomedesis, and I am also the, an assistant professor of uh, medicine in the Division of Sports Medicine at NYU Langone. Um, School of Medicine. So just a little bit about our practice. Uh, Orthomedesis is part of Jamaica and Flushing Hospitals. We represent all subspecialties of orthopedics, including trauma, sports, joint replacement, spine, hand, foot and ankle, pediatrics, and oncology. So we really cover the gamut of, of all subspecialties within orthopedics. Um, all of us are credentialed at Jamaica and Flushing Hospitals, as well as at NYU. And we're all faculty um, at NYU as well. We have uh, multiple office sites uh, throughout Queens, including Richmond Hill, Woodside, and Fresh Meadows. Uh, these are some of our surgeons. You might recognize uh, most of us or some of us. Uh, we even have non-operative specialists. Um, so we really cover the gamut here. Um, so again, this is just a little, little bit about all of our surgeons and what we do. And there's a QR code. and you know, we're happy to uh, answer any questions after this about our practice, and I'm happy to answer any questions about shoulder instability. So this is what we'll get into here, and this is the outline of the talk. I'll speak a little bit about history and physical, operative versus non-operative treatment, a little bit about surgical planning, and, and some surgical cases as well. So hopefully it's interesting for all. So just to do a little bit of background, shoulder dislocations are a pretty big burden on society. There's a high incidence and prevalence as far as emergency room visits and doctor's office visits, and it's usually occurring in young patients. So about 50% of patients who experience shoulder instability are younger than 30 years old, and it can have long-term ramifications, especially if left untreated, and that's something I'll speak about. So this is the shoulder joint. The shoulder joint is the glenohumeral joint, or the glenoid, which is the socket, and the humerus, humerus which is the ball. They're aligned with articular cartilage, which is a smooth surface, which is normally smoother than ice. Um, and you can see here the glenoid is, it's a socket, but it's a very shallow socket. And unlike the hip, it's, it's you know, it, it's so shallow, it allows great range of motion. I mean, the hip can't do it, the shoulder can, you can't, you don't have such great range of motion of the joints like the hip that you do of the shoulder. But because of the great range of motion, there's a high incidence of instability or shoulder dislocations. Um, surrounding the glenoid or the glenoid fossa, which is again the socket, is the labrum. The labrum serves to deepen the socket, so it's very important in, in the shoulder because it deepens the socket, provides more stability, and it's also the attachment of the ligaments, which we'll speak about. You can see the long head of the biceps tendon attaches to the superior aspect of the glenoid uh, or the supraglenoid tubercle. So where are the shoulder stabilizers? stabilizers? What keeps the shoulder in place? Well, the, the, there are the bony stabilizers, which is the glenohumeral joint. There are soft tissue stabilizers, and there's static ones and dynamic ones, and we'll speak about that. So here's the bony articulation. The head neck angle of the humerus is about 130 degrees. It's typically retroverted about 30 to 40 degrees from the epicondylar axis. And the glenoid itself is usually about neutral, but can be up to five degrees of retroverted or have five degrees of superior inclination. And that's the bony contact. The labrum, like I said, is extremely important in shoulder stability. It's a triangular rim of fibrocartilage. Again, it serves to deepen the socket by up to 50%. And sectioning of the anterior inferior labrum, or what we call the Bancart region, can decrease the contact area by 15%. It's torn in up to 90% of traumatic anterior shoulder dislocations in young individuals. And here are the capsular ligaments. So the capsular ligaments um, attach the glenoid to the humerus. They're capsular thickenings, essentially. And they do attach from the humerus, or the, the humeral side, to the labrum for the most part. And you can see that here. So that's why a labrum tear can kind of compromise the glenohumeral ligament. And that's part of the static soft tissue stabilizers. So here are the um, glenohumeral ligaments. 
the IGHL, the inferior glenohumeral ligament is the most important. The anterior one is most important for anterior disc to prevent anterior dislocations, which is the most common one. And it resists anterior translation and external rotation and 90 degrees of abduction. The middle glenohumeral ligament can also be important. It resists anterior and posterior translation 45 degrees of abduction. So here are the shoulder ligaments, and you can see A is the superior glenohumeral ligament, which does pretend some stability in zero degrees of abduction. And as the shoulder is abducted from 45 to 90 degrees, the glenohumeral ligaments get tighter. The middle glenohumeral ligament at 45, and the inferior, especially the inferior anterior glenohumeral ligament at 90 degrees of abduction, as can be seen on the right. The rotator cuff interval potentially has an important role in shoulder instability. The rotator cuff interval is the space between the supraspinatus and the subscap, which are two rotator cuff muscles. Um, importantly, within the rotator interval is the long head of the biceps, which probably does portend some stability to the shoulder, as sectioning of that or tension, actually tensioning of that has increased the ability of the joint. What about anatomic variants? So these are important to know, especially on the surgical side or anybody that's reviewing any MRIs, um, because these, these can be missed or these can be thought to be a labrum tear when they're really not because they're an anatomic variant. So there's a sublabral foramen or a Buford complex. So you can see here the sublabral foramen, which is just a little bit of space between the glenoid and the labrum, and a Buford complex, which is a cord-like middle glenohumeral ligament with an absent labrum. And this is also important because you don't want to mistake this for a labrum tear. Um, a surgeon doesn't want to go in and repair this and potentially over-tighten the shoulder. Because again, this is an anatomic variant. And this is what it looks like surgically. It looks like there might be a labrum tear, a loss of tissue on the glenoid. The glenoid here is on the left side. Here it's on the right side. This is in the beach chair or upright position. And this is just an anatomic variant. This is not a labrum tear. It's just a cord-like middle glenohumeral ligament or a sublabral foramen. Okay, what about the rotator cuff muscles? So these are the four rotator cuff muscles. You have the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor, which are the top and kind of posterior rotator cuff muscles and tendons. And then you have the subscap in the front. And all these are important because they increase the joint reactive force. They push the humeral head against the socket. And they are dynamic stabilizers because they act within motion to stabilize the joint and, again, compress the joint and increase the joint reactive force. So what about the decision-making tools that the medical community looks at when deciding treatment options on shoulder instability? So the history is very important. You want to understand the patient's gender, their hand dominance, what their age is, what type of activities do they do? Do they do high-level activities? Are they bike riders? Are they not? And things like that. How many recurrences have they had? What was their age at their first recurrence? And how easy is it for them to dislocate and, re and, and relocate because if it's easier to dislocate and relocate, there's probably more degree of instability. So on physical exam, we start, you know, besides we always start with inspection, palpation, um, vital signs, things like that. And then we go to strength testing. So the rotator cuff and the deltoid are very important. Um, again, because these are dynamic soft tissue stabilizers. Especially, I like to test the deltoid, which can be tested here. The th three heads, the middle, posterior, and anterior heads of the deltoid can be tested on the left. And that's important because those are supplied by the axillary nerve, which is the most commonly injured nerve in a shoulder dislocation. On the right panel here, you have testing for the rotator cuff. This is the Jobes or empty can test, which isolates the supraspinatus. This is external rotation, which is more the infra. And this is a subscap test. This is called the liftoff test here in panel C. What about specific testing for shoulder instability? So this is the one that I use most frequently, which is the anterior apprehension testing. The arm is, the patient's laid supine, the arm is brought into abduction and external rotation, and they'll feel apprehensive, they'll feel nervous, they'll feel like their shoulder's gonna pop out. And you do have to be very careful with this because you don't wanna dislocate their shoulder, especially in acute phase. So I would probably recommend against this in like an ER setting. Um, you know, in an ER setting, they're gonna come in uh, you're going to get x-rays, and we'll speak about the types of x-rays that you get, and we can just do some gentle motion. But more in the office or in a subsequent visit, you can kind of do this testing. So this is the apprehension on the left. 
On the middle, this is the relocation test. So I have my, you know, in this case, what would be my left hand there pushing posteriorly, and they'll feel better. And then when you remove your left hand or remove that posterior force, they'll feel apprehensive again. How about Kim testing and posterior jerk testing? This is when an axial load is placed across the arm and then the arm is brought into adduction and you'll feel kind of like a clunk. This is for posterior instability. And posterior instability is a bit different from anterior instability. Again, this was anterior apprehension. Uh, posterior instability is more of a chronic, like overuse injury. It can be seen in pictures and, and, and things like that. Uh, what about load and shift testing? So this, the arm is loaded with a force applied across the glenohumeral joint, and then it's shifted anteriorly and posteriorly. And this is best done under anesthesia in this case, but you can do it in an office setting. Um, you can try doing it in, in an ER setting too. You probably won't dislocate them. And this is how it's graded. Middle, minimal displacement at zero. Grade one, humeral head reaches the glenoid. Grade two, humeral head dislocates, but spontaneously reduces. And in grade three, the humeral head does not spontaneously reduce. So that's how the load and shift is tested. How about O'Brien's test? So O'Brien's test, the arm is brought across the body, adducted, internally rotated, and they'll feel pain. And when supinated, they feel better. And O'Brien's testing is a superior labrum test. So that's more for like a slap tear, which is less important in stability, but still part of the labrum, and I think still an important exam to do. Okay, sulcus testing. So this is for an overall degree of instability. So the arm is pulled down, and you'll see the sulcus between the acromion and the, and the humeral head, and that's a sulcus sign. How about other hypermobility testing? Well, I always do the Baton score, uh, which is a score for, again, instability. A uh, score four or more tells you that they have a higher degree of instability. And you do it on both sides. So hyperextension of the small fingers, of the small finger, passive thumb to forearm, uh, elbow hyperextension greater than 10 degrees, knee hyperextension greater than 10 degrees, and the patient being able to um, place both palms flat on the floor with their knees locked in extension. So that, that's how you get to, it's at a nine. All right, so the next steps after history and physical evaluation is the imaging. So imaging, a standard shoulder series always includes an AP. I typically get a gracie view because this is more an on fos view of the glenohumeral joint, you can see here, you see a perfect space between the glenoid and the humerus. You also see space between the acromion and the humeral head. Um, so this is basically a perfect AP. And this is how it's shot. It's actually shot with about a 45 degree tilt because you wanna be on plane with the scapula. And there's a scapular wide view, which is important. Now this is somewhat like tech and operator dependent because you do have to get this perfect view here so this is the scapula, the shoulder blade coming up. This is the spine of the scapula leading to the acromion. And this is the coracoid here. So you get this wide view. And you'll see kind of the humeral head should be centered on the glenoid, which is right here. But this can be deceiving and that's an easy view to get, but it doesn't, in my opinion, really substitute for an axillary view. Axillary view is important to get. It's typically shot up the armpit like this with the plate on the patient's neck. Or there is a modified version either a rolled cassette or you can place a cassette under them and have them lean back and that's called a Balboa view. And here, here, this is the best, most sensitive view to rule out a shoulder dislocation where you'll see the humeral head articulating on the glenoid here. And this is very important like an ER setting and a consult setting um, because you can easily miss a posterior shoulder dislocation on an AP view. It won't, you know, it, it may just look like a light bulb sign. And in a wide view, it's very, like I said, operator dependent. So if you don't have a perfect wide view, you may miss it. So very important, we'll always get the axillary view. Then in an office setting, on an orthopedic standpoint, you can start to make out um, degrees of retroversion. You can see arthritis. You can see narrow, narrowing of the glenohumeral joint. So this is a very important view in the office. Here are some special views, which with modern day imaging have kind of fallen out of favor but some people still get them and I think they are, you know, they're, they're interesting to know about. So the striker notch view looks for a hill sex lesion. A hill sex lesion is essentially a, uh, an osseous lesion or osseous kind of divot in, in the uh, humeral head that's created when there is a shoulder dislocation. So this is diagnostic of a shoulder dislocation at some point in the patient's life. And so again, when the shoulder dislocates, 
the humeral, get, humeral head will kind of bang against the glenoid and create this lesion. Uh, this is the West Point view. So West Point view, again, is a little bit historical, but can take a look at the glenohumeral joint and look at the glenoid very well. Uh, and you can also kind of make a bony band cart lesion. So bony band cart lesion is when the labrum tears and bone is taken off. And that's pretty important because it can lead to higher rates of instability. All right, so MRI. So MRI is really the most important imaging tool that we use uh, currently. It evaluates soft tissue really well. MRI evaluates soft tissue better than CAT scan or, or X-ray, and it's a three-dimensional image. So we can evaluate the labrum, the capsule, the rotator cuff, and the articular cartilage. Currently, we try to send patients for 3T MRIs as it's demonstrated very high sensitivity and specificity, and that's without contrast. If you're getting a 1.5 Tesla MRI, there may be utility to adding an arthrogram, which is injecting dye into the joint, because that dye can really help you identify a latent tear. And that increases the sensitive sensitivity from 83 to 98. And again, sensitivity is ruling out a tear, which is very important. But you know, again, sensitivity being 89% in a 3T, it's pretty good, and you can avoid a contrast injection. So if anybody's ever had that, which I have, it's not much fun. It's pretty painful, actually. So patients don't like it. So what about CAT scan? There is a role for CAT scan, um, especially if you're looking for any bone defect. So for multiple dislocators, you want to evaluate the glenoid and look for any fracture. Look for bone loss, because after multiple dislocations, you can lose uh, bone. It helps evaluate the size of the hill stacks, which we'll see is important. And if in a revision scenario, you can look at anchor placement. So what about non-operative treatment? Well, a non-operative treatment consists of activity modification, bracing, and physical therapy. So what about bracing? So most evidence shows that there's really no difference between bracing and not bracing as far as recurrence in an acute phase. Um, I still do recommend that, especially for comfort. A few studies have suggested immobilization and external rotation biomechanically when you external rotate the arm, uh, kind of in this gunslinger position here. It seems to reduce the labrum to the to the glenoid better. So there was a thought that maybe it would heal more appropriately, but it looks like probably clinically it doesn't matter. Um, and there was a recent study on placing the patient in external rotation abduction versus just operating them after a solitary dislocation, first time dislocation, and operative cases did better. And what about physical therapy? Well, physical therapy can be important for strengthening of the rotator cuff and periscapular muscles and kind of help stabilize the joint. So it's never wrong to try that, especially after a first time dislocation. Unfortunately, the results of non-operative outcomes are not great. Um, recurrence rate has been up to 100%, even a two-year outcome, a two-year follow-up, mostly in young patients. And we'll see there's been some scoring studies on this. So again, you know, most of the time there is a recurrence rate, you know, anywhere between 50 to 100% based on the patient's age. A lot of us quote this, the Bardino study, which is a West Point study, so it's young, active, healthy cadets, and long-term nine-year follow-up, they had 85% recurrence rate. So really not great. We'll see why. This is that study I just had, I just looked at using a sling. May, I mean, this is not a head-to-head -head versus just non-op, but maybe a sling does reduce the rate, but that was only two years. And, and operatively, it was 2% of recurrence. So we'll see why. Maybe we're leaning towards more operative intervention. So what, what's the effect on the cartilage after a shoulder dislocation? Well, studies have shown that there is an increased risk of arthritis. So this was a study looking at the effect on the articular cartilage, and there was damage to the articular cartilage on this uh, T1 MRI, T1 row MRI study at multiple aspects of the humeral head and also at the anterior inferior glenoid around the band cartilage. So what about the long-term outcomes of non-operative treatment? So this is a really, really nice study. It's a little bit older because it was published in 2008 and it's a 25-year follow-up. They had 161 patients treated non-operatively and 62 ended up getting treated operatively after recurrences. And this is a great study on long-term outcomes um, of non-operative treatment. It's a Scandinavian study, so they have stable populations and good long-term kind of longitudinal data. So the predictors, predictors of arthropathy, which is arthritis, were recurrence. So recurrence can lead to arthritis, which is really bad. 
Uh, young, uh, older age, so patients that they saw at an older age were at higher risk for arthritis, those that were involved in higher energy sports, and those that abused alcohol. So what were the overall rates of arthritis or arthropathy in, their, in this 25-year follow-up in 223 shoulders? Well, overall, there was 25% of moderate to severe arthropathy. Without recurrence, 50% had some arthropathy. Luckily, only 17% had moderate to severe. One recurrence was 35% moderate, moderate to severe arthritis. Surgery did decrease it, and surgery was the same as no recurrence. It was about 17 to 21% moderate to severe arthritis. So just one shoulder dislocation or one shoulder dislocation and then subsequently having surgery still had a rate of 20% moderate to severe arthritis, but overall much better than having even one recurrence, which was 35% arthritis, uh, or just general recurrence was up to 30%. So in, his, in this study, uh, more than one in five patients ages 17 to 22 years had moderate to severe arthropathy. One recurrent dislocation or subluxation event over 25 years increased the rate of arthropathy by, 20, by 50% and the rate of moderate to severe by 100%, so really bad. And operatively treated had less arthritis than recurrent instability and those that healed all the time, but was the same as a solitary event. And this is what you want to avoid, is arthritis uh, after multiple shoulder dislocations. Now, this study, I don't really hang my hat on the operatively treated rates because this was done mostly open surgery. Uh, this was before arthroscopic surgery. But I think that there is value in understanding the natural course of treating these non-operatively, which is not, not great. And this really changed the paradigm as well because at this time, they thought that maybe operating on them was leading to arthritis. Um, but it turns out it's probably not. So what about operative treatments? This is the stuff that I like speaking about. So what's the goal? It's to prevent, prevent arthritis, allow the return to sports and activities, and improve patient-reported outcomes and quality of life. So surgical options. So surgical options are arthroscopic or open labrum repair, also known as capsulorophy, which is repairing the capsule. Remplissage, which we'll speak about, which is filling in that divot or that hill sacs lesion on the back of the humerus. Uh, in French, it means to fill in, and what we're filling it in with is with rotator cuff. Uh, coracoid base transfers or other bones such as allograft uh, reconstructions. So what are factors to consider when deciding upon what surgical treatment to do? So this is the, the instability severity score, and it kind of puts together history, physical exam, and radiographs. So age at first dislocation gives you two, you know, the 20 gives you two points. Uh, participation in competitive sports, two points. Participation in contact, one. Hyperlaxity, like the Dayton score is one. Radiograph on the ER, seeing a hill sacs, gives you two. And loss of normal contour of the corner gives you two. Anything above six had a 70% rate of recurrence with just soft tissue repair, so just labor repair. So above six, you want to probably start thinking about a coracoid transfer called a ladder J or another type of allograft transfer uh, to the front of the glenoid. A very important factor is also bone loss. So traditionally 20 to 25% of glenoid bone loss or 25% of hill sex lesion was considered severe and might require like a more invasive surgery. Uh, it looks like it's actually additive as uh, combining a glenoid, glenoid bone loss and hill sex lesion can decrease stability by 18 to 22%. And there may even be a subcritical bone loss. So this is one study on 72 patients showing that at 13% glenoid bone loss, uh, there was uh, increased risk of potential instability um, and worsening out outcome scores and, and in just general worse outcomes. So what about the glenoid tract? So this is a little bit like confusing topic, but I think it's important to speak about. So the glenoid tract predicts the hill sacs engagement with the glenoid. So this is what it looks like on a 3D CAT scan. And this is the glenoid. So the glenoid is a circle head. We make a best fit circle. And after multiple dislocations, some glenoid bone loss can occur. Now it turns out that at any one time, only 83% of the glenoid is articulating with the humeral head. So you take 83% of the glenoid, and then you subtract the amount of bone loss. 
and that is your glenoid tract. Then you measure the size of the Hillsex lesion here. So if the Hillsex lesion is bigger than that glenoid tract, it's called an off-track lesion, and it's more likely to engage. And engaging is not good, it's gonna to lead to more instability. It's kind of like uh, driving a car and there's a pothole. If the pothole is big enough, or the hill sex is big enough, the tire will fall in, and that's not good. Or if the tire supposedly is really small, then the tire can, can kind of fall in. So that's kind of the analogy. Or if the tire is big enough, it could roll over even a big pothole. So if the glenoid is big enough, there's no bone loss, it's less likely to have an off-track region. This is more of a surgical thing. So is this important, this glenoid concept, which has become really like a hot topic lately? Well, probably. Um, there's been a 90% intra-observer reliability on glenoid bone loss, but only 80% on the hill sacs. And that's because there's multiple ways to measure the hill sacs. So nobody's really sure which is the best way. And it's actually only 70% determining the on-track, off-track. So not horrible, but not great. But there is a clinical application as 75% of off-track lesions failed a normal bank heart or labrum repair. So this is kind of like an older school algorithm that we use. We looked at the glenoid bone loss. If it was less than 25% and it was certainly less than 15%, you can do a bank heart repair. If it's more than 25% bone loss, you can go into a ladder J or potentially fix it if it's more acute. Depending on the amount of humeral bone loss, you can do an allograft or a hem hemicap. Essentially, you can do a remplissage in less, like 20 to 40 percent humeral bone loss. And then a bipolar lesion is just another topic. But really, I look at this one. So, 0 to 50 percent glenoid bone loss will probably do fine with an arthroscopic repair, incorporate the bony fragment, use anchors, and even think about adding a posterior repair or adding a rum passage. 50 to 25% overall is controversial. I would include any bony bank heart lesions if possible. You can consider adding uh, an open procedure like an open labrum repair. Um, and then above 25% bone loss is like pretty much a no brainer. Proceed with some sort of bone transfer to the front of the shoulder, whether it's a corticoid transfer or allograft. So summary of factors that are important in treatment, their age, because the younger they are, the more likely they are to keep dislocating. If it's their first time or multiple instability events, multiple instability events, you want to think about operating earlier. Are they a contact athlete? That's usually a poor prognosis. Do they have hypermobility, which is not great overall? And what's their exam like? And most importantly, I think is bone loss. So ISIS score plus bone loss. And so you'll see if they have a lot of bone loss, you'll get an exam like this, where it just kind of locks out. And it can really slide over the head. Another way of measuring kind of the glenoid bone loss and probably more accurate way is doing it intraoperatively. So you can use this area called the bare spot as the 50 yard line and understand from there how much glenoid bone loss is. Now, unfortunately, it's a little tricky to use in real life application because, you know, you kind of, first of all, you have to get this pro perfectly par uh, parallel to the glenoid, which is sometimes not that hard, depending on how your portal is, not that easy, depending on how your portal is. And then once you've scoped them, you've kind of already made that decision to scope them. And a lot of times I'll do this in lateral position. Now you may have to reposition. But if you're not sure you're in between, it's certainly reasonable to maybe scope them in the beach chair and then decide what to do after. So should we operate sooner? So should we operate after maybe a first time dislocation? So this was a recent study, 2019, primary arthroscopic stabilization of first time anterior shoulder dislocators, and they did really well. So this was a randomized controlled trial done in Europe where they can do this kind of thing where they just wash out the shoulder or they did a labrum or known as bank car repair. And what it showed was that there was a significantly lower rate of recurrent dislocation in those that had repair. So only 12% versus about 50%. They also had improved WOSI scores, which is a patient report outcome score. However, there were no difference in overall patient reported satisfaction or return to sports. So what that means to me is that patients can return to sports, but it's certainly reasonable to consider fixing them in the beginning and potentially preventing bone loss and having lower rates of recurrent dislocation, which we all know is important, which we now know is important. Um, for preventing arthritis, which is really something you want to avoid. 
So what are the surgical options? So again, labor repair, remplissage, corticoid transfers, allograft reconstructions. This was an algorithm that was put out and there is a lot of controversy in this topic overall, I think, because I agree with some of these, but not all. So recurrent instability, known loss, open versus arthroscopic, bank car repair, I would say that's reasonable. Recurrent instability with no bone loss, open repair versus bladder J, oh, that's in, in a high risk sport or uh, you know, high, high contact sport, or they're saying don't even do arthroscopic repair. I, I think that's somewhat debatable because there's a lot of downsides of open surgery, including stiffness and you know, screw breakage, infection, things like that. So I think that's debatable still. Glenoid bone loss, uh, I probably would agree with that, ladder J. Failed ladder J or 25% glenoid bone loss, free glenoid bone grafts, I think that's, that's reasonable. And then there's the on-track, off-track. So in an on-track, they're saying add a remplissage, and then an off-track, they're saying do a bank card and add a helisex graft, so I'm not sure I agree with that. I would say that for an on-track, I would do a bank card repair, plus minus a remplissage, how it looks, and an off-track without glenoid bone loss, so just like a big hill sacks or maybe a little bit of glenoid bone loss, like five, 10%, then I would do a bank car repair with a bank massage. We'll talk about that. So I just wanna go, I mean, I don't wanna spend too much time this evening, but I don't wanna leave a little time for questions, but I'll try to get through a couple cases. So this was a 15 year old right hand dominant female, competitive basketball player, who had two prior dislocation subluxation events with recurrence a couple weeks before I saw her. She had full range of motion, she had apprehension, she had no sulcus sign. Her x-rays were normal. Her instability severity score was she was less than 20 in her first time. She was a competitive overhead athlete, but no hyperlaxity and no changes on, on x-ray. So she had a five. So she's, you know, she's kind of in that in-between range. She's under six. She's under six. So, you know, she's probably still reasonable for a labor repair. It's probably 10% chance of dislocation on her. Here's what her MRI looks like. So you can see here, there is a labrum tear or separation. I just wanna show it to everybody. Separation between the labrum, which is this black triangle here. And this is normal in the back. This is attached to the glenoid and here is it, here's the tear. So the labrum is here, this kind of black structure here. And there's a white like signal here or high intensity signal between the glenoid and the labrum and that's a tear. You can see it here. So you can see comparing the back to the front, the front has a labrum tear. Um, we do have access at some of our institutions to 3D MRIs, which is nice because we can avoid the CAT scan, although it's not 100% validated yet. We're working on it and it's looking pretty good. So there appears to be no glenoid bone loss in this case. There is a small hill sex lesion here, about 13 millimeters. So what's the plan? Again, so she had a low, a low to medium ISIS score, but no glenoid bone loss in a young patient. This is, a, that's never had any surgical treatment before. This is an arthroscopic treatment for me. So this is what it looks like inside. So here's the glenoid and here's the labrum. And the labrum just doesn't look good. It looks absent. It's not a good bumper. It's not deepening the socket. Coming around posteriorly, it looks okay. Here's the hill sacs, which is actually kind of wide, but it's shallow. So, you know, we don't really know how much the shallowness matters. Probably less likely to dislocate if it's shallow, if it's not as deep of a divot. But it does look a little bit wide. Um, and then what I did, I didn't show it here, but I ranged her and it did not engage. And that's even before. So I decided not to do a remplissage in this case. Um, here I'm elevating the labrum. And then we go ahead, here's elevating the labrum more. So you want to elevate the labrum to repair it back. And here's the post after the repair. So it's a four anchor repair. Um, and then I'm bringing, kind of bringing the labrum up here. That's a nice bumper. So you can see the difference on the pre here. There's not much and post it's tightened up. It's brought back up. So what are the results of arthroscopic bank call repair? Well, in the short term, they're really good. I mean, there's about a zero to maybe 5%, three to 5% rate of redislocation. So really good in that two to three year range. However, when you go long-term, you are getting an increased risk of dislocation, even up to 10%. So it's something to consider. And in contact athletes, you know, it probably does not as well. Even at three to four years, there could be a 10% rate of dislocation. Now I'll tell patients this, that it's 10, maybe up to 20%, depending on how, how athletic you are and on multiple factors, including their instability or their overall laxity, but it's better than 
hundred percent without surgery. So think about it. Basically, hundred percent without surgery. So open bank card repair. So it's kind of coming back into favor a little bit. Um, it looks like it decreases the recurrence rate as compared to as compared to scope. Uh, but you know, there's a greater risk of nerve injury. There's potential motion loss. Um, so. You know, here's one study showing how arthroscopic improved over time, 16 to 14% rate of redislocation, but open was a consistent 10% rate. So probably a little bit better with open. That's what it looks like. So what about case two? So this is a 41, a little older guy with a traumatic shoulder dislocation with continued pain and instability low Baton score, overall normal looking x-ray, MRI shows, of course, a labrum tear. Again, 90% of individuals are going to see it. This is a really obvious one. So look at the back first. That's the labrum, this posterior attaching to the glenoid. And here's the labrum in the front, completely detached from the glenoid. And also a 20 millimeter hill sac. So it's a pretty big hill sac. And here, this is blunting of the superior labrum with the slap. And when you do this measurement, it turns out there's, there's a minimal glenoid bone loss, but it is off-track lesion. So if in this case, we went ahead and saw that there was a labrum tear with actually cartilage loss, so this patient's getting arthrosis already. There's a labrum tear extending all the way up top here. It even comes posteriorly a bit. Uh, and there's a very large hill sex, which, you know, actually when I went ahead and measured this, it was, it was off-track, but it was close, but clearly it's off-track here. So what are the options for this patient? Well, this was an interesting case. This is the remplissage. So adding rotator cuff to the back of the humeral head, releasing the biceps, doing a biceps tenodesis as the patient is over 40, and then repairing the labrum. And this is what a remplissage looks like. Again, so you're taking the rotator cuff and you're filling it in uh, to this hill sex lesion. So now hopefully this hill sex will not engage or catch the front of the glenoid. And it looks pretty good. On-track lesions had, in this study, a low rate of, an 8% rate of recurrence uh, with just a band cow repair. However, off-track, meaning that the hill sex was large or was engaging with the glenoid bone loss, had a 30% rate of recurrence. But when you added the remplissage, it went down to 3%. So it looks pretty good. Uh, overall, in primary surgeries, remplissage had decreased, a little bit decreased rotation, but decreased complications as compared to the latter jet. Lange is a much bigger surgery with increased uh, complication rate, although it may be more stable, may pretend more stability. And so just in case, because I'm still working this patient up, 23-year-old male with epilepsy, which has been uncontrolled for many years, many shoulder dislocations, already showing, showing arthritis even at the young age of 23. And this is a significant amount, 25% glenoid bone loss. You see it's no longer a circle, it's like flat. And this is also a large hill sex. So what to do about this one? Well, you can do band cart, open repair, ladder J, or ladder J and possible bone grafting. So bipolar bone loss. So um, a review of bipolar bone loss for 30 month follow-up showed inconsistent reporting on the hill sex measurements. It showed recurrent instability rates with a band cart and run passage did help. But in really large ones, um, you probably need something more something like an osteochondral allograft. So osteochondral allograft, you can see here, you can take bone and fill in the hill sex lesion. Not that many studies actually on this. Uh, one study here was a two-year follow-up in only 19 patients with 30% hill sex loss. They had high satisfaction, but they had 40% graft resorption. So bipolar bone loss is definitely an issue. Um, just with soft tissue stabilization, it can have a 20% redislocation rate. And certainly with larger ones, there's going to be a higher rate of redislocation. So what about this older female, you know, not older, but as far as instability, middle-aged female, acute dislocation 20 year, years ago, multiple redislocations re since then, had a band call repair 16 years ago, and has had increasing pain and apprehension without injury. So here you can see metal anchors were used over a decade ago. On her MRI, she had labrum tear and also a lot of kind of cartilage defects. Um, you can see she had a lot of loss of glenoid here. This is about 28% glenoid bone loss, so really a critical bone loss. So this we recommend glenoid 
tra bone transfer to the glenoid. This is a ladder J. The coracoid up here is released and transfers through subscap split to make a longer or bigger glenoid. And then there are other things such as distal tibia allograft. Turns out the distal tibia articulates really well with the humeral head. And so that can be added to the front of the glenoid as well. And arthroscopically, that's what we did for this patient. So this is an arthroscopic ladder J, which is a technically demanding case, but basically arthroscopically adding bone to the front of the glenoid. Um, overall, these have really good rates of reducing dislocation. Dislocation, recurrent dislocation rates as low as 5%, lower rates of instability and subluxation. Uh, but there may be earlier failures uh, up front. Um, there, are, there is a serious complication risk, though, even though it's a good surgery. 6% infection, 9% non-union, 10% neurovascular. So there's a risk to, to the muscular cutaneous nerve. And if that is stretched or torn or damaged, the patient can lose elbow flexion. Um, overall, a systematic review of over 400 band card and over 300 ladder J's showed across the board, ladder J probably does decrease the rate of recurrence. Probably has a similar revision rate though, decreases the rate of dislocation or subluxation, um, and ladder J has a pretty good motion afterwards too. So again, ladder J is probably better for a loss of loss of bone, but there is a higher rate of dislocation rate. It may not be worth it. Um, and then you know, there's arthroscopic procedures. It can pro it's kind of early on. It probably does just as well, but it, there is an increased risk of time. And it's pretty hard to position the graph properly. Um, maybe using a button would be helpful. All right, so I have one more here. So this is, again, a failed prior arthroscopic stabilization in 28% glenoid bone loss. And this patient actually failed a prior uh, ladder J as well. So now the patient's failed multiple interventions. Um, and, you know, the screw had to be taken out. And you can see kind of the screw track here. So this patient got a distal tibia allograft. So this is what it looks like. Allograft is donor. The distal tibia portion is taken. It's the lateral side of it, and it's added to the front of the glenoid. So you can see here, it really collapsed quite well, increasing the width of the glenoid and decreasing the chance of dislocation. And this was done through a lesser tuberosity osteotomy. It is the main and that patient did well. So allograft reconstructions are becoming very popular, especially with a significant amount of glenoid bone loss. All right, so it's been about 45 minutes, so we'll leave a couple minutes for questions. But in conclusion, shoulder instability is a wide spectrum of disorders. Age and activities are key. Always consider bone loss, have a number of tools and techniques available, and long-term goal is preventing arthropathy. All right, so I don't know if we can you know, see if anybody has questions. Uh, let's see what we got. I'll have a chat. Okay, good. So I got a couple questions. So Carrie Burke from IV Rehab Great asks, what kind of role do what kind of role do hypermobility concerns for Ellis Dandler play in your decision for surgical versus non-surgical as well as surgical procedure? All right, really good question. So Ellis Ellis Dandler's patients. For those that don't know, is a connective tissue disorder, which basically the patient will have hypermobility and be at increased risk for dislocation. These are some really challenging patients to take care of. Um, in my experience, like in this case, in multi-directional instability, you actually do want to try non-operative treatment because surgical treatment can fail. I mean, almost anybody can blow through as, we, as we've seen an arthroscopic repair. And Ellos Downlos patients will be at increased risk for that. Um, however, in a patient that's had multiple dislocations and that's just not doing well and is having a lot of pain, that case I would probably consider a distal tibia allograft. So I might, if they fail conservative treatments, um, I would probably consider adding uh, bone to the front of their socket or ladder J, but you know, with connective tissue issues, I don't want to stretch any nerves. So that's why I'm thinking more of um, adding bone to the front of the socket. But really good question and really challenging patients to take care of. All right, so another question here uh, from an athletic trainer. Amanda, thank you for your question. What are your guidelines with the return to play after an acute episode, first time versus chronic? Okay, 
Really good question. So this comes down to athletes. So a lot, it depends where the athletes are in season, but a lot of athletes want to get back to play for that season. And that's something that we usually can't do and try to wait for the end of the season. So what we do is a short period of immobilization, uh, potentially two to three weeks. And then we work with physical therapy to get physical therapy and their athletic trainers to get them back to play. It probably will take somewhere between six to eight weeks to try to get them back. Um, sometimes a little bit sooner, um, just depending on how stable they are and how they're feeling and what their comfort is and what their exam is. Um, you know, if you have a chronic dislocator and they're coming out, I mean, it's a, it's a patient specific decision. If they're coming out, I probably would say maybe you want to take the season off and, and then, you know, consider surgical intervention. But if they're, it's like their senior year and they're trying to get a scholarship, then we might just have to work with them and just try to get them through the season. But it's definitely a risk benefit analysis. And, you know, you have to discuss with the parents or the athletes. You don't want them to end up getting arthritis just because they want to get a scholarship either. So it's kind of an overall treatment goal. But a really nice question. Hope that answers it. Mike Stracker, one of my partners, asks, are you serving refreshments? So no, but I like that idea, maybe in the future. All right, I'll throw my video back on. Um, if we don't have any questions, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, and okay, so we're gonna probably have a few of these series. So mine was from the sports medicine side, um, but we're, going to have all of our specialists kind of weigh in. We're going to have joint replacement ones, trauma one, pediatric one. So we're really looking forward to it. Um, we're looking forward to a good series. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's pretty much it. All right. So thanks again, everybody. Um, and perfect, yeah, have a good night. Oh, hold on one sec. What's the best way to reach out for getting someone to see you? Oh, very important, very important. Okay, so um, you can find, you can book appointments online at NYU Langone. Um, you can come see us in Woodside and I'll give you the phone number, but also, you know, the phone number, I mean, I don't know if you wanna write it down, but here in Woodside, it's 929-429-3222. But yep, yeah, as Brittany said, ortho, orthomedicist.org is another way. And Brittany, do you have the email address too? There's a hotline that you can email and we'll, you know, we'll get patients in. And obviously to our physical therapy and ATC colleagues, um, we always prioritize. We try to get your patients in within one week. And we really appreciate communicating with you and looking at your notes. Uh, it's really, really important. And you know, one thing from from my mentors that I learned is communication with physical therapists and, and, and all the providers is extremely important for the outcome of the patient. And it's over, it, all, it definitely is a team approach. So really, really important. All right, so Brittany's gonna send a follow-up email with all the contact information. And yeah, thanks everybody for joining. We really appreciate it. Thanks everybody.